So hello and welcome to tonight's event at NCLA, the Newcastle Centre for the Literary Arts at Newcastle University. I'm Rachel Hewitt and I am Director of NCLA and it's so lovely that you could all join us this evening. This is our last event before Easter and I hope you'll agree with me that it's been such an invigorating term of events and conversations. It's been a term of events that have made me think quite a lot about loss, you know, possibly because we're in the middle of this pandemic and this lockdown. But I think there's been this sort of undercurrent of interest in loss that has run throughout the term's events, which has been slightly unintentional. Our first event of the term was Hermione Lee talking about her wonderful biography of Tom Stoppard. And that made me think about unlived lives, sort of lost chances, the lives that we lose the possibility or opportunity to live. And then our event with Kerry Andrews talking about her book, Wanderers, A History of Women Walking, made me think about lost stories and lost voices and what we lose when we lose those kind of diversity of ways of seeing the natural world. And then Cal Flynn's fascinating book, Islands of Abandonment, made me think about lost places and what it means for humans to leave a place and nature to come back. And then Roger Clark, of course, was speaking about ghosts and why humans turn to the idea of ghosts when they're in the midst of loss. And then last week, Jen Hadfield spoke and read from her poetry about redressing the loss of neurodiverse voices. And Rowan Ricardo Phillips read and spoke about losses from gun violence. So it was an unintentional theme, but I've really gained a lot from this term's events and thinking through them about this idea of loss and other things as well. And I hope you have too. Um, if you've missed out on an event and you want to um, catch up or you want to re-watch um, re an event, then you can watch the recordings on NCLA's online archive, which is at archive.nclacommunity.org. Now, although this is the last event of um, before Easter, the last event of term, it's not the last event of the semester. After Easter, we have three more fantastic events. Charlie Gilmore, who spoke about his wonderful memoir, Featherhood, last semester, is going to be in conversation with US biographer Blake Bailey about his forthcoming biography of Philip Roth. Then in May, we have novelist Niven Govinden, who's going to be talking about his novel, Diary of a Film which is a novel about cinema, flanners and queer love. And it's received rapturous reviews already in newspapers like The Guardian. And then finally, to end the season, we have the multi award winning, including the Costa award winning novelist, John McGregor, who's going to be talking about his forthcoming novel, Lean Fall Stand. This hotly anticipated novel is based on 17 years of research into Antarctic expeditions. And it explores the far reaching consequences of accident and tragedy and what happens when communication fails. All of these brilliant events after Easter are still going to be online. They're still going to be free to attend, but you will need to register for them. So to do so, please go to our website, which is www.newcastle.ac.uk forward slash NCLA. Now tonight's event also has resonances with this undercurrent of loss in a book that features, among other things, ghosts appearing in a gothic Japan. Tonight's speaker is Natasha Pulley, who will be reading from and talking about her most recent novel, The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow. Natasha is an award-winning writer whose first novel, the international bestseller, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, won a Betty Trask Award, was shortlisted for the Authors Club Best First Novel Award and was a finalist for the Locus First Novel Award. Her second book, The Bedlam Stacks, was shortlisted for the Royal Society of Literature's Encore Award and longlisted for the Walter Scott Prize. 
And tonight's event marks the launch of the paperback of her third novel, The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow. Natasha will be in conversation tonight with Laura Tisdall, who is a writer and a historian and a fellow in history here at Newcastle University. We're really lucky to have both of them here tonight, and I'm so excited about tonight's conversation. So I'm now going to hand over to you, Laura and Natasha. Hey, um, thanks for that introduction, Rachel. Um, so I thought I'd just start with saying a little bit about the book, just for anyone who hasn't had the fortune of reading it yet, and then I'm going to ask Natasha some questions, we'll have a reading, and there'll also be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, I've had a few through already, but um, if you think of any at all, any point in the event, just put them in the YouTube chat and I'll pick them up nearer the end and I can ask some of those to Natasha. Um, so The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow is the sequel to Natasha's previous novel, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. But I think, although some reviewers seem to disagree with me, I found today, but I think it can be read as a standalone. I think it works by itself um, if you've not read the previous novel. It's set in the late 1880s and it follows Spaniel Steepleton, a translator and former boxer, and Kate Mori, a clairvoyant watchmaker who lived together in London with their adopted daughter Six. When Mori abruptly leaves to Japan, Spaniel follows him, and without saying too much about where the book goes from there, they're swept into this world of mysterious electrical weather and clusters of ghosts, among other things. Um, so yeah, it's a really it's, it's a really brilliant book and it's so atmospheric. So I'm really excited to talk to Natasha about it tonight. Um, I mean, I thought I'd start by asking, how on earth do you even start plotting a book about a clairvoyant who knows what's going to happen in the future? Do you do it backwards? How, how did you handle that? You're exactly right. It has to be backwards, um, which is a nightmare, and it's why my Plots are terrible. I, I, I can't write plot. Um, and it's because they are all backwards. And it's because whatever I write on page four, Maury already knows, which means that everything, and as soon as I get to page 300 and I decide that, oh, the plot has to change, then it then it has to go back to page four. And <laughs> yeah, um, so it is a plotting a character like Maureen does mean that the plot kind of happens in these weird spirals. And hopefully it makes sense at the end. Um, but it but it is um, unnecessarily complicated, and I never wrote it down anywhere. Um, it was very annoying. So like, between drafts, I would forget what had happened or where it was going, which was very irritating. <laughs> and it also it raises all these questions about motive because if he knows what's going to happen, he can stop it. I mean, how do you handle that? Like, I'm becoming a sort of super villain or an un unlikable character absolutely fiendish and this was one of the reasons it took me ages to write this novel because I knew what I wanted to happen and you know you you have to have a certain number of unknowns as a writer as a reader in order to generate any tension at all but if you have this bastard character who knows everything already because they they are clairvoyant it makes that element of tension really really difficult to get hold of and I, I think I've done about 10 drafts of this book. And there was one point where I gave it to my publisher and she was so annoyed that she gave me the unedited interns report that said it was confusing and bewildering and unreadable. And I went away and I went, yeah, it, it's true. And worse than that, you just hate the main character because he seems to allow all these things to happen. And right at the end of the process, I finally got to a proper motive, a proper reason, I've finally worked it out in a, in a decent way, but it took me years. I was so impressed by it because actually, I, when I was reading The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow, I was working on my novel, which is about time travel. And Ooh. obviously that, that throws up all sorts of cause and effect problems, but in the opposite direction. Um, but then I realized that you've also written a novel about time travel, your upcoming novel, The Kingdom. So I don't know if you found time travel easier or harder to write than clairvoyance? way easier everybody <laughs> should do time travel novels they're so much fun they're much easier to plot because you can do it in a straight line people just move to and fro along the straight line <laughs> um whereas the the problem with with this character in the lost future of pepper harrow his, his name's cater maury um <coughs> is that he sees possible futures so so there are many um, and that is very difficult to keep a track of. So I would absolutely recommend to any writer to do the time travel thing and not the clairvoyant thing. Um, 
one thing I think that's really striking about all, all your novels actually is how you take kind of real historical settings and events and then you put in this sort of into the speculative and I didn't know if you want to talk a bit about how you handle that like fit, fitting the stuff in around real historical events in this novel the Russo Japanese war is one absolutely and there are um there, there are loads of real things pouring into this book like uh, it, it during the course of the story um a Japanese government minister is assassinated. That really happened on the day that it happens in the book. Um, and so one, one of the things that I find really interesting is blurring the line between history and something more speculative. And it is my favorite thing to try and make that line invisible. So you don't know where you're moving into magic and you don't know where the real history is. And I think as soon as you pull away the curtain and look at how it actually works, the answer is always that the line is actually further into history um, than you would think and all kinds of nutty, bizarre things happen. Um, and I, so I would say that actually nine tenths of this book is completely true. Um, all, all the major events really did happen. Um, a lot of the characters are real people. Um, and a lot of the, like, the insane sounding science in it was completely real um, and it's it's all based on work by um, by Nikola Tesla um, so only about that that extra 10 percent is just pushing it a little bit further but but the rest of it like the the line is really well into historical fiction rather than speculative but it looks like it's not which I'm really pleased about no I think it's a great balance um it just occurs to me it's perhaps a bit of a weird question but have you ever had that thing where you you want something to be real and you research it and find out it was that you, you start off making it up and, you, and then it's actually rooted in reality honestly taking the words straight out of my mouth you really have and I <laughs> bet you find this with your time travel novel as well um when I was writing my first novel which is called The Watchmaker of Filigree Street um I had the, I had this Japanese main character Keita Mori um immigrant from Japan and I just sort of plonked him into Knightsbridge in London because that was the only place in London at the time that I'd ever visited. Um, I'm, I'm not from London, I'm rubbish at London, and I just went, oh, I've heard of that, great. Um, and then as I was reading, and as, and as I was writing, I was like, why, why, why would a Japanese watchmaker move to this particular district? That's insane. I need to, I, I need to find out where the real Asian population was in London at this point. <laughs> It was in Kensington and there was actually a, a show village, like a model Japanese village um, on the corner of Hyde Park. And there were about 250 Japanese artisans there. And it just worked out that Mori was one of them. Oh, that's fantastic. I think that's when you know the plot's going right when that happens, that you're on the sort of right, right track. Definitely. And it, it makes, I think it reassures you that you're thinking about the time period in the right way. If you've got your head in the right space, you can often anticipate odd events in history because it's kind of like given the conditions at the time and you know you, you add A, B, A, B, C and D, there are certain things that almost certainly happened and you only have to go out and find them and confirm them. And maybe they're a little bit different to what you thought, but they are there. And there comes a point where it's almost mathematical. There are quite a lot of real historical people in your books and events, and as, I, as I've already said. Um, do you, how do you handle the sort of the responsibility of, because you've got people like um, Clement Markham in the bed and stacks, who have a quite a different, like, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, track, they track a different fate, perhaps, than they'd had in real life. And how do you, do you feel responsible about that? How do you handle that as a writer? Yes. I mean, I think if I were writing about people who were still alive, um, I... I would go into a full moral crisis about it because obviously you have to be incredibly careful and, and treat people fairly. The character who I struggled most with in The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow is this guy who's prime minister of Japan in the late 1880s. His name is Kiyotaka Kuroda. And he was a bastard. He was a crazy nationalist bastard who liked to invade Korea all the time. He was nuts and he probably killed his wife. But at the same time, he was a real guy and you, you read stuff that he wrote or kind of view quotes from him in articles and he's also very funny. Um, and it's just trying to, trying to write someone who history has not looked upon kindly. Um, that I found really, really difficult because there, there's that authorial urge to treat your characters well. 
um, and to not demonize anyone. I hate it when writers just say, oh, that's the bad guy. Um, so that I found that really problematic and I really struggled. But I, I, I think basically what you do is you sweat blood over it. You hope for the best, run it through a sensitivity read and then keep hoping for the best. <laughs> It's an interesting point about morality, actually, because I feel like quite a few of your, your novels have kind of protagonists who make us a bit uncomfortable, like not just not just Mori, but also um, in the bed and snacks, you have Merrick, um, like the sort of like Grey, which I think I think is brilliant. Um, is, is that do you deliberately seek out to write about characters like that? Yeah, definitely, because I think one of the things that you kind of have to think about if you're writing historical fiction in English is the fact that I mean, so I'm writing 19th century stuff. If you're writing about the 19th century, you have to tackle the fact that Great Britain is this massive colonial empire and we were largely assholes. So it's just really, um, you, you kind of have to bring that into writing these characters. And in order to get into an, into an accurate mindset, um, particularly for you know, middle-aged Victorian men, you sometimes have to go to quite an ugly place. Um. Yeah, I guess, can I ask you about writing sort of 19th century Japan from that angle? Because I feel like there's a really interesting author's note at the end of The Lost Future of Pepper Harry talk about language and like rendering Japanese in such a way that it doesn't seem really artificially like stilted and orientalist. Um, I don't know if you can say a bit about writing Japan and writing Japanese, like rendering Japanese in the novel. Definitely. Um... So I, I speak Japanese. I used to live in Japan. I lived there for two years, learned Japanese. I worked at a Japanese university. Um, I taught creative writing. Um, a lot of the kids didn't speak English. So that, was that, that necessitated a certain level of Japanese. I am not fluent. You, it would be very difficult to be, um, to be a Westerner and fluent in Japanese with kind of less than 10 years study. But I, I got in a good two and I was okay. Um, and one of the things that I really notice about the way that Japanese is translated into English is that people try and go about it a bit too literally. If you translate Japanese literally into English, if you do it completely literally, literally it's nonsense because the sentences are different. But even if you kind of hold back from that and still go for you know, basically what that person is saying, you come out with something that sounds like 15th century courtly love. Um, it, they have, Japanese has many registers of speech, more, more than English does. Um, and once you get towards the formal levels of speech, it just sounds ridiculous in English because we just don't speak like that. But it makes complete sense in Japanese. And it's in, in Japanese, it's not overblown or massively courtly or, or any of that. And likewise, it, it has like these amazing kind of lower rungs of register as well. And there are plenty of dialects and plenty of ways of talking in registers that just, they sound exactly like Essex English. Um, or, and there, there are regions where there's a really clear accent and a really clear dialect. And it's like going to York or going to Newcastle. And people are, people are proud of their dialects. Of course they are, because it's varied and brilliant. And none of this um, is usually reflected in the way that British writers either write or translate Japanese in books for English readers. And so one of the decisions I made in this book really early on was I am not going to do Japanese in the way that you expect to hear Japanese. It's some, sometimes characters are massively formal. Um, sometimes they are quite beautifully spoken, but mainly not. And even in like, so for example, take Samurai. Samurai men in this period did not speak nicely. They were sweary, grunting bastards, and um, it's just and that's 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 what I wrote. Um, so yeah, there is. I think Japanese is one of those languages where you have to think about cultural translation as well as linguistic translation. Not just wow, well, what are they saying? You have to think about yeah, but what do they mean? And often those two things are a little bit different um, when you're translating from a language that is as far from English as Japanese is. So yeah, when you when you read the book, um, the characters, when they, when they speak Japanese, they can sound actually like very British and very ordinary. And that is, that, that was my intention and I hope it works. 
I mean, I don't speak Japanese, but it works for me. Um, it, it, it's like a really great approach. And I, I sympathize with something like Middle English in my time travel novel. And it's the same problem. If you render it, literally, people sound so distant and so stilted. Um, and you want to portray them as human people. So it's like, and it's difficult with historical fiction, isn't it? Like that, because as you progress further along in time, those historical registers go up and up and up because they're associated with the language of your grandparents or further back or whatever. And by the time you're kind of here and Chaucer is over here, it sounds dreadfully formal, even though like for him, that's like effing and blinding and being really common. So yeah, like to totally empathise. Um, I feel like, have you ever thought of, Writing a novel that's not in the 19th century, because you've, your novel's in the 19th century so far, like sort of mid to late 19th century. Um, have you ever thought of writing something completely different or a completely different historical period or even a contemporary novel? No, so, I've never tried a contemporary novel, but what I'm working on at the moment is something set in 1960s Russia. Um, and this is this is around kind of the the Soviet nuclear shield and interesting nuclear bits and bobs. So that that's a very different country, very different time, um, different worldview as well. And I'm really enjoying it. It's it's lovely to get away from the 19th century, even though I do like it. It's it's nice to get a bit closer and write about things where people have televisions and radios. It's really it's really great. <laughs> no more telegrams. <laughs> no, no more telegrams. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, that's fascinating. So that's right, right in the peak of the first Cold War. So that must be exactly, that. exactly. Um, another thing I wanted to ask, but I guess writing historical fiction is, especially from a sort of speculative lens like you do, um, is how far do you think this helps us actually get at the past in a different way, particularly if you're using these kind of speculative elements alongside the historical context? So. <laughs> as with everything I'm massively in two minds about it on the one hand I totally agree with those people who say it's obfuscatory like how can you possibly learn about Victorian history if you've bunged in a load of magic how are people supposed to tell what is fact and what is fiction completely understand that point of view on the other hand I think if you treat speculative fiction right um, it can help you get in the mindset of somebody from a particular period much more easily. This idea that we know uh, exactly how things work, how science work, how facts work, um, that, you know, that, that we know exactly what electricity is, um, this, this is all very, very modern. In order to get back to the way that someone from the 19th century really thinks, and th this is a time where people are doing seances because it's, that's current science. Um, it has all this stuff hasn't been disproven yet. People like Arthur Conan Doyle and Houdini are still in, investigating spiritualism way after this. Um, go back to that and force somebody to imagine that ghosts could be real or that clairvoyance could be real. And I think you're actually getting much closer to what a real Victorian 19th century person's thought process would actually be because there's no voice in the back of their head that says, this is all very intriguing, but of course it is wrong. Nobody's thinking that. Or if they do, that's a bet. That isn't knowledge. It's a guess. Um, so if I think if you deploy it like that, speculative fiction can actually be incredibly useful. Yeah, and no, that is what I love about your books, I think. There's a it's a biography of St. Augustine by Peter Brown, I think. I think this is Peter Brown biography, um, obviously like the early Christian thinker. And he just says about St. Augustine in the middle of this academic biography, um, he'd spoken with demons and he knew people who had been possessed. So he doesn't say he thought he knew he'd been possessed. To Augustine, it's real. He did know people who'd been possessed. And that's like- yeah, I think that's exactly the right, I think that's exactly the right um, viewpoint to take of, of historical figures because there's, you know, none of these people sort of finished their lives and went, and yes, of course I was deluded the entire time. Like to, to write as if they were is to impose a very, very modern, very different point of view over their world. And that in itself is obfuscatory. So in some ways to peel that away, it's necessary to use a certain amount of fiction, a certain amount of speculative leeway. Well, also it assumes that we are at the peak of knowledge and know everything, which is 
not true. <laughs> Which is absurd. And I guarantee that in 200 years time, there'll be a pair of novelists like you and me talking and they'll be going, oh yeah, we had to deploy a certain amount of fantasy in this book because we just can't get at the 21st century viewpoint without exploiting a certain amount of fiction because we know that all this is rubbish now. Yeah, they'll be like, yeah, their understanding of neuroscience was quite poor. So they thought these, <laughs> these made up things about it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to ask. Um, I think of all your books, I thought like time is a theme, whether it's forward clairvoyance as in Lost Huge Pepper Harrow, whether it's time travel or whether like in the bed and the stack, so I can't really say it's a spoiler, but there's there's definitely time, I think, is a theme there as well. I don't think you want to say anything about, about that and the focus on sort of time and I guess loss as well. I just really love timey-wimey books. I grew up watching Doctor Who. Um, I grew up on a healthy diet of Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. And I don't think you can be exposed consistently to all three of those things without one day writing a timey-wimey book. Um, I've now written four timey-wimey books. I'm hoping to sort of slightly come away from that <laughs> in, in the future. Um, but I think... Time is just one of those uh, endlessly malleable themes for writers because it's so vast and we all experience it so differently. And there are many ways even beyond what we experience to think about it. Um, so yeah, it does crop up in all three books that I've got out so far. It will absolutely be part of the fourth. Um, the fifth is gonna be more about radiation. <laughs> Actually, I was just thinking, maybe this is not a part of your book at all, but like Soviet and American visions of the future in the 60s are kind of amazing. Um, they're, just, they're, they're just a very specific kind of idea of what the future is going to be like. I know, where's my hover boots? <laughs> well, why can't I fly to the moon? It's very annoying. Um, no, it, it is really, really interesting to read science fiction from any particular period. And I think one of the things that's really come out of um, kind of reading around Russian literature is that they got to loads of sci-fi stuff way before we did. They were thinking about it differently. They were more aware of the science. There was a kind of more of a demand in these books for the reader to understand quite complicated science, which I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really fascinating thing to look at. I think this is why the 19th century is so interesting in terms of time and of timely novels as well, because it's when they kind of invented sci-fi, well, maybe probably invented sci-fi and sort of ideas about the future and thinking about the future in a certain way. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do think it's something to do with the fact that this is the first time in human history where people are developing technology that you cannot understand at a glance. Like before this, you can't write anything very mysterious or tense about like a plowshare. It's pretty obvious how a plowshare works. And we get a few fantastical stories, well, a lot of fantastical stories about enchanted swords, but that's not the physical working of a sword. That's something mystic that's been kind of woven into the fabric of it. But by the time you get a steam engine, and you know, the, obviously the, the first public railway line was 1825, the Stockton and Darlington Railway Company from Newcastle. Um, this, this is the first time people are really in their daily lives, I think, surrounded by devices and technology and science that you need to, you know, you need to study, you need to go back to school in order to understand this. And I think this is one of the reasons why we see Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein in the same period that Luigi Galvani is doing all the, all the electrode experiments and frogs and, and weird stuff. This is it's kind of weird at the time and slightly threatening to see something being performed in front of you and to just not understand. And I, I think that basic uncanny jolt of kind of not just technology, but of the weirdness of technology, this is where we start to see sci-fi. Okay, it must've been quite, it must've been very strange I think in the 19th century, because I think we talk a lot about the 20th century and the 21st century being like explosion of technology, but, um, I read this book by an economist once and he actually pointed out that the invention of the telegram speeded up communication much more than the invention of email. So actually that's a bigger jump in some ways um, for people and their understanding of the world. Yeah, it, it's massive and it really came out of nowhere, didn't it? I mean, like what, one day everyone's, you know, going with the Royal Mail. The next day some Italian does something funny with a thing that taps and then everybody can communicate 
very quickly. It changes international relations. It changes the way that people talk to each other. It changes everything. And so I think this is a really, it's a nuts period to live and, and to write about. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to ask a couple more questions and then I think Natasha will do a reading for us. Um, I've got a few questions in from the audience, but we'd love to have more, so do keep them coming. Um, I wanted to just, I was just gonna ask you a bit about writers you think have either inspired you or writers you think are similar to your work or you bounce off or like who do you see your work sitting with speaking to? Sure. So particularly for Watchmaker and also for Pepper Harrow, um, anyone who reads it will see a massive dose of Sherlock Holmes in there. Um, again, Arthur Conan Doyle was just some, somebody who I read compulsively um, when I was a teenager. And I just never quite lost the magic of that fog bound London, which I really adore. Um, and it's the reason that I still love the London Underground today and Baker Street with its portrait tiles of Sherlock Holmes along the walls. Um, so that there's certainly that. Um, and I was also very much influenced by a fantastic fantasy writer called Robin Hobb. Um, if anyone in the audience hasn't heard of her yet, please go out and read her books. They are bricks. They're like this. You can use them as doorstops or to nail up shelves. But they're the most detailed, amazing high fantasy. And they are, honest to God, orders of magnitude, more complex and psychologically realistic than anything that George R. R. Martin has has produced. That's very unfair on George R. R. Martin, but it's also true. Um, so, those, so those are two huge, huge influences for me. Brilliant. I have to admit, I've not read Robin Hobb and I'm a big fan of George R. R. so I thought I have to get out and read her immediately. <laughs> if you like high fantasy, Robin Hobb is queen. She really is. Um, and are, are you reading anything good at the minute you'd recommend? Yeah, I just started this. It's called The Other Black Girl. Um, and it's set in um, a publishing house in 2018. And there's a black girl who's a publishing assistant at um, a very kind of snobbish, very white office in New York. And one day they hire another black girl. And at first she's completely overjoyed. She thinks this is gonna be a kindred spirit. And then very slowly, she realizes that there is something terrible going on and it all draws back to this one girl. Um, and so far it's really, really fascinating. And, and again, it's, it's told from the point of view of this really flawed protagonist. So she's annoying and arrogant, but also brilliant. Um, so I've been like, uh, I only started reading it this morning and I'm, I'm 150 pages in already. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I've got the ARC of that one on my Kindle, actually. I'm really looking forward to it. So it's great. Yeah, it's really, it's very, very clever. Um, what do you, would, would it be all right for you to read a bit from the book to us now? And then I'll take some audience questions. You've got quite a few coming in now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so contrary to my normal form, which when I write, which is I tend to start in the middle, realize eventually that it is the middle and then start again. I'm actually gonna start at the start, if that's all right. I think that does actually make sense in this very weird book. And this, the first time I have a prologue as well. So here we go. It's easy to think that nobody could really arrange the world like clockwork. All sorts of things would get stuck in the mechanisms. History is full of queens and generals who've given it a damn good go, but failed because of nothing more complicated than the weather. But clairvoyants have a knack for arranging time, and it was not without a sense of irony that Cato Mori was a watchmaker. In his workshop, it was difficult to see what he was making until it was done. A sort of organized chaos characterized the way he worked, so much that he could be constructing something for months or years, and it would only look like a tangle of something generically worrying, right up until it got up, walked off, and turned out to be an octopus. It was even harder to tell what he was making when he was using time and not steel. But if you knew him quite well, it was possible to discern when he was arranging something, and perhaps even sketch out the shape of its tentacles. One tentacle began to take a clear shape to anyone watching closely enough on the last day of October in 1888 in St. Petersburg. Pyotr Kuznetsov was surprised when, after not having seen each other for five years, Maury sent him an invitation for coffee at the Hotel Angleterre. Hotel 
bloody Angleterre, Piotr snarled at nobody as he crossed the road, which startled a boy who'd been shoveling snow. On the great official map, Japan hated everyone. It was one of those deliciously rich but underdeveloped little countries that everyone wanted to invade, Britain, Russia, America. But Russia was closest, and so if there had to be a ranking, it was number one on Tokyo's to be stabbed list. Piotr and Mori shouldn't have been friends. Officers in enemy countries' secret police were expected not to be, but they'd always been exact counterparts throughout their service careers. They both existed with one foot in often unpleasant, boring business, the other at black tie events at embassies. They both disliked flag waving and Americans. Maury could drink properly and Piotr knew all the rules of sumo. They had a lot more in common with each other than with the flag waving ministers they worked for. One small spanner in the otherwise smooth works was that Maury was, and there was absolutely no getting around this, rich. He did horrible things like invite Piotr to fancy hotels as though any normal human would even get through the door at the Angleterre. Tolstoy was staying there now. Piotr had never lost an instinctive anxiety about places with gilded frescoes and resident novelists. Mori had retired from the Japanese service a few years ago, or so he said. He had been living in a suite at the Angleterre for six months, making clockwork for the Tsarina. It was the most stupendous cover story Piotr had ever seen, because Mori was making clockwork for the Tsarina. She had given the Home Minister a watch a few months ago and he'd been showing it to everyone, including Piotr. It was gorgeous. Piotr was willing to be called Katerina for a year if Maury really was here for clockwork. Oh, thank you. Uh, what I love about that actually is it sets up this point in history where Japan is kind of like not important. It's about to become very important in world affairs. Like the, yeah. the, it suddenly comes on the world stage after the Russia, Russia Japanese war, everyone's like, this country is dangerous. Yeah, definitely. It was probably after they bought a massive fleet of ironclads from Liverpool where everyone went, oh, hang on. <laughs> yeah, and it also, actually speaking of like books that are in conversation with each other and kind of read alike, so have you read Nina Allen's work? No, I haven't. It just occurred to me thinking about the clockwork and the watches because she has a book about watches, um, but her books are very timey-wimey, so I would recommend. I feel like there's a there's a similarity. Um, my favourite is The Rift. Always up for timey-wimey. I will look that up immediately after we finish. Yeah, look at Robin Hobb. Um, brilliant. We've got some questions in the audience. We've got some that are coming come ahead of time and some that are coming to chat now. Um, I'm going to ask this one first because I love this question. Um, so this person says... Um, this book ripped out my heart in a good way. I don't think I've ever read something so beautifully painful about yearning. Did it hurt you to write Faniel and Maury's five years of miscommunication? And why do you think mutual pining is so key to the queer experience? Oh, what a question. <laughs> um, I, it was, it was really, really difficult to write because of course, like every paragraph made me cry. Um, it was, in, in another way, it was easy to write because this is entirely my experience of being in a relationship. <laughs> um, and I think it's, I think it's vital to the queer experience because particularly in this time period, it's not like you could come out and ask someone, well, are, are you gay? Are we okay? Is, is this okay? Are, are we like, are we together now? Are we not? Like, See, so this is, this is something that Daniel and Maury never talk about. They can never speak about it. Um, and, they, and they never speak about it for different reasons. That Thaniel for very Western reasons and Maury for very Japanese reasons. He thinks that he's an old guy perving on some beautiful young pianist. Um, so they just they just can't talk. It, it is the love that dare not speak its name um, for, for many, many reasons. Um, and it's something that, that just Thaniel kind of constantly worries over. So I thought it was really important to write that. And, and I think in a... I was I was reading um, I was reading Song of Achilles um, by Madeline Miller, and I love that book. I think it's beautiful. But one of the things that really struck me about it was that this this is a culture where this relationship is normal. And then I realised that I I could never I could never do that for the nineteenth century because this is not a culture where this was normal. So that so, hence the pining, hence the endless endless pining. <laughs> And I guess it's, um, I'm just going to follow up on that before asking another audience question. Um, I guess it's also this period where gay is not identically what people use. So 
homosexual as a behavior more than an identity and so that makes it it's kind of very hidden experience and it's a very problematized behavior um i it, it was con it was considered um a mental health condition where you could be you could be sent to the asylum for this uh, so it, so again like the, the reasons to not say it really pile up mm, it's illegal um if you're a man anyway yeah um I think I've covered this question already about plot twists. Um, should not. So someone's asked, do you anticipate or map out your fantastic plot twists or do you discover them as they emerge? This is a very arty and airy fairy thing to say, but I absolutely do discover them as they emerge. And I'm very ashamed. I wish that I, I wish that I did plot them out. I wish that I had a graph with, you know, string and <laughs> line. But, but I don't. And I, I think one of the really important things to let yourself do when you write, and Laura, you can say if you agree with me or not, um, is to give yourself space to just like let something appear on the page. Because sometimes it's nonsense. Well, nine tenths of the time it's nonsense. But one tenth of the time, there's some part of your brain working at the back that you're not aware of at the front and something unexpected happens, but it works and it fits the story. Um, and I very much believe in letting that part of my brain come out on the page. And it's, it's usually where like my best writing comes from, which worries me because it's completely involuntary. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I mean, I used to think I was a planner and I do plan when I write very carefully, but that, what that actually means in practice is I have about 20 plans that keep on getting torn up and yeah. rewritten. So it's not really like I'm working to a blueprint. Yeah, no. I, I usually know where I want to end up, but it's usually really hard to get there. I usually have to have about 12 goes at it. Yeah. I find that amazing there because your novels are so intricately plotted. You must have to rebuild quite a lot if you're writing kind of intuitively and then try to make it all fit together at the end. It, it's, it's, it's all a clever illusion. Um, I, I would say for 99% of the drafting process, it's a mess. Like it barely has a plot or I kind of know which bits should be fitting together, but they're not knitted up yet. And it, it just reads as nonsense. Um, and it only, it really only comes together. Like, so say it, say it takes me like a year to do a draft. It would really only knit together in the last two weeks of that. So it's just like, it, it's there. And the reason it takes so long, my theory is, is that it takes you about that time to, in your head, get a decent idea of the shape of any book. And I don't mean like book shaped. I mean <laughs> the, sh the shape of the plot. Um, and until you have that in your head, and if, if you have that in your head, you don't need notes. You don't need to write it down. Until you have that, you don't know what's wrong with it. You can't see where the lumps and bumps are. You can't see where it needs hammering out. Um, so I am, I've resigned myself to the fact that I'm doomed to wait. Yeah, and something that I think is really difficult about speculative fiction particularly, like if you're writing hard sci-fi, I think your plot has to make complete sense and be logical, but I feel like there's this element of speculative fiction that's quite magical, and so it's how much you explain to the reader and how much you leave hidden. That actually is where... I do all my planning. Like, so I won't necessarily know how the plot works, but I do have to know how the science works. So it has to all link up. It has to be based on something real. I can't make this stuff up. I don't have a good enough imagination. So everything that is in this book is just a deduction of what would happen if Tesla's theories about electricity were true. That's all that's going on. Um, but that is, that, that's where I spend the most time definitely is, you know, numbers and working things out. That actually feeds into a question from somebody called Humblebee. Um, <laughs> it's about categorization, I think. Um, would you consider your writing so far to be neo-Victorian or does historical fiction seem more accurate to you? So I think that genre is something that publishers tell you after you have finished a novel. Um, it is in its essence a marketing label. I don't think anybody, maybe with the exception of Lee Child, sits down and says, right, I am now going to write a neo-Victorian speculative fiction, or I am now going to write a hard-boiled crime novel. You, you write the story that you are interested in. Um, often this falls into broad categories like historical fiction or hard-boiled crime. Um, when I was 
pitching these books to my agent, I kind of made up a genre. I said, oh, it's historical fantasy. And she went, oh, goodness, I haven't read any of those. I was like, I know, because I've just made it up. Um, So I think to some extent, genre is an artificial thing. To some extent, it describes certain characteristics in a set of books in the same way that the dictionary describes the language rather than prescribes the language, even if those of us who really like categorization want to think it's the other way around it. It's definitely not. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. Um, So I don't have any strong opinions about what these books are, whether it is neo-Victorian or historical fiction or fantasy fiction or any of it. I tend to just make up something new every time I have a book out and I talk about it. And if I, um, if somebody says, oh, but two years ago, you said it was this. And I go, do I? It doesn't matter. (laughs) Um, I've also got a question, I guess, goes back to this sort of thing of how you construct the book and how you write the book. Um, This person said, uh, Maddie says, um, I'd love to hear more about your characterization, especially characters like Grace Carrow and Pepper Harrow. How do you develop your characters and do they give you input on their own development? I guess the sense is, is it character led? Is there something that's happened with the characters? Yeah, Yeah, and I I think actually, if you're going to write a really good plot, and I'm not saying this is a really good plot, I'm just saying this is my best shot so far, um, it is important to let the story be character led. Because if you don't do that, you're in danger of kind of shoehorning these characters into situations that they would never have got themselves in. Um, And one of the things that I found about this character, Pepper Harrow, her name, well, that's her surname, her name is Takiko. One of the things I found about her was that she kind of wasn't doing a lot of the things that I wanted her to do. Um, Because a lot of the things that (laughs) I initially wanted her to do were kind of, a kind of a bit passive and a bit pathetic and she was mainly just waiting for things and then eventually I sort of went no she owns a kabuki theater she's cutthroat she's nuts she's capable so in the final draft she's you know she's kind of plotting herself and making pushing the plot along and befriending prisoners and having guards beaten up and that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't sat back one day and gone it's just not her doesn't work and it's way easier to change the plot than it is to change a character um in in the same way that it's it's easier to work around someone you know rather than try and change their opinion yeah and I guess thinking about those characters in particular um I feel like in your novels you tend to have and this I don't think this is a problem I think it's interesting you tend to have sort of queer men at the center and you have these brilliant female characters but there are secondary characters um I, I, I don't know if that's is, 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 is that a deliberate pattern or is there anything you want to just yeah definitely I mean it, it's fully escapism I mean I have to I have to live my life as a woman of a certain age um, and I I write to escape I, I write in the same way that I, I watch dramas on television um so it, it it and I've never felt the urge to write about myself I find that really, really difficult. So obviously all the characters have bits of me in them. There there are occasions where somebody who knows me goes, you you stole that from Maury, that's what he said. I'm like, no, he stole it from me. But it's just, I don't have that urge to kind to particularly pour um, gender concerns onto the page. Um, Or certainly not women's gender concerns. I live with that all the time. Um, And so to some extent, a male perspective is an escape. Um, so that's why the female characters are often a little bit back. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. That's, that's a very unworthy reason. Um, but it is, it is escapism. (laughs) No, I identify that as a reader as well. Absolutely. Um, Poe wants to know if it's not a spoiler, I'd love to ask if the watchmaker slash bedlam slash Pepper Harrow universe ends with Pepper Harrow and will we see any more from that timeline? So it does end with Pepper Harrow. Um, there will there will be a watchmaker short story coming out around Halloween. Um, it's called The Eel Singers, and it will be out in a collection published by Sphere with um, quite a few other writers who are better than me. And I don't know why they invited me to do that because yeah, um, but it, w- it will be out in that collection around Halloween. Um, the next book is a complete standalone, um, and it's it's very very different, but it is also timey wimey. So I think you can you can tell that I wrote it, and. Um, the, the narrator is, uh, I would say, quite similar to previous narrators in that he's kind of snarky and 
hopefully funny and a bit hopeless. Um, so it will it it will still be me. Um, but yes, I'm I'm moving on. I, I think my I think I'll give myself an aneurysm if I if I have to write Case Mori anymore. <laughs> I think I'm gonna leave them alone. <laughs> be more clairvoyant. <laughs> yeah. So um Sasha's next novel, The Kingdoms, is out in May. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. Uh, so I, I've had the fortune of reading it already, and it's absolutely fantastic. So I absolutely recommend. Um, but yeah. Um, so The Kingdoms um, moves into a slightly different time frame to what I'm used to. It follows what might have happened if Britain had lost the Napoleonic Wars. So it opens in a London that has been conquered by France a hundred years ago. And the, the main character steps off a train and finds that everybody is speaking French, uh, including him. And he doesn't understand why, doesn't remember how he got there. Um, and he tries to work it out for a long time, but can't and settles to a, kind of quite an unpleasant life in French London. And then one day he receives a postcard that appears to be from a hundred years before, but is nonetheless addressed to him at the place where he lives. It's clearly for him. And it says, come home if you remember. And it's got a picture of a lighthouse on the front. And from that moment onwards, he starts to try and find out where this lighthouse is, why it's special and who you sent this postcard because they clearly know who he is. And that's the book. <laughs> I've just realized when you were saying, um, the protagonist of this book knows nothing even about himself and is feeling his way forward completely in the dark and it's the opposite of being a clairvoyant. Was that, was that deliberate to get away from him? Yeah, this is very refreshing. I was like, you go from clairvoyant <laughs> to amnesia. I was like, this is, this is nice. I can do whatever I want with this. <laughs> it was lovely, yeah. Oh. Got a couple of questions about ideas and how you what, what originally inspired you to write Watchmaker and Pepper Harrow. Um, I think always you never have one idea. It will be ten ideas, and human brains are amazing blenders. You can feed in ten ideas. Your brain blends them up, and then something else, apparently unrelated will pour out the other side. And I think that's what Watchmaker definitely was. It was um, partly a response to Sherlock Holmes. The love triangle in Watchmaker is very much a response to Sherlock Holmes. It always annoyed me in the Sherlock Holmes stories that Watson's wife never fought for him, even though Holmes, charming though he is, is obviously dangerous. This is a stupid person to hang around. Um, and yet Watson does, and his wife lets him, like she never, in, it was in, in the books, no, in, in, the, in the films every now and then she sort of has a go. Um, but in the books, she never tries to confront Holmes and, and say, no, look, he has to, at the end of the day, he has to come back, he has to be alive. What are you doing? You're crazy. You know, in the end, a professor is going to sling you over a waterfall in Germany. I don't like this. I don't want this for my husband. Like she, ne she never does that. Um, and that's the reason that Grace in Watchmaker does fight. Um, so that, that was all based on Conan Doyle. Um, it was all set in London because I read an amazing book by Neil Gaiman called um, Neverwhere, which I love. Um, and it's it's all a kind of a fantasy world in London underground stations, which has forever made London magical for me. Um, a lot of the tone is straight out of Terry Pratchett because I love writers who don't take themselves too seriously, who can write funny things and serious characters who who sometimes giggle. I really like that. Um, I very nearly used footnotes either. <laughs> like Jonathan Strange. Like Jonathan Strange, exactly. And there's there's a big dollop of that in there as well. Um, yes, so I think it is just a kind of a blending up and a mixing of all the things that I was reading at the time and actually a lot of what I was watching. I was a real um, anime geek when I was a student, which is when I wrote Watchmaker. Um, I was watching a lot of Japanese sci-fi films as well. So it all sort of fed in. And I think um, I think I owe a lot to kind of uh, the Japanese storytelling structure, which is slightly different to just act one, act two, act three. Um, often it kind of goes a little bit further, which I think is really interesting. And I tried to do that as well. Oh yeah, my, so my sister's a traditional storyteller, performance storyteller, and she tells a couple of Japanese stories and they, they're really wrong for audiences because they don't end where you expect them to end. No, often they, they end slightly after or even slightly before, which can be really uncanny and weird. Yeah. I feel like before we finish, because of our accidental theme for this um, 
semester, I have to ask you about ghosts. And, uh, and the ghosts in Pepper Hair aren't really what we'd think of as ghosts. So I don't know how much I can say about them without spoilers, but I don't know if you wanted to say anything about. Oh, I just kind of weighed on in with spoilers. Um, <laughs> so basically, I really love the history of science. Um, and, and any of you who like the history of science will know who Nikola Tesla is. Um, he was a he was a physicist in the 19th century and he had all sorts of nutbag ideas about electricity and how it worked. Turns out he was wrong. Um, but what happens in Pepper Harrow is a kind of extrapolation of what might have happened if he had been right. So that's where all this comes from. And you do get ghosts and you get um, kind of free electricity in the air. So, you know, light bulbs are turning on. If you just touch them, humans conduct electricity. Um, weird storms over Mount Fuji, um, all, all sorts of uncanny things. Um, but it is all based on Tesla's theories um, and what would happen if they were true. Yeah, no, it, it, it's so uncanny. Um, the atmosphere of the novel is just beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're coming towards eight o'clock. So I think I'll leave it there if no one has a very last minute question. Um, well, thank, thank you so much, Natasha, for speaking to us tonight. It's been so interesting to hear about your forthcoming novel and the novel after that, which is I'm very excited about. I love Cold War stuff. Um, um, and thank you to Rachel and Melanie for organising and Pete for doing the tech as well. Um, so yeah, and I hope I hope to see you all at other NCLA events in the future. Brilliant. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a real pleasure. Okay, good night, everyone. Thanks for coming.